Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Killer Mike to the stage. You want to hear a good joke? Nobody speak, nobody get choked. What's going on, y'all? How y'all feeling out there? So, as you uh, all know, we have the illustrious Killer Mike joining us. I go by the name of Torre. I will be moderating this conversation. Thank you all for being here. It shows that you care about yourself, your craft, the business, the art form. And that's definitely something I'm interested in talking about with this man right here, man. I mean, he's an artist, he's an entrepreneur, he's an activist, he's an actor, he's a husband. Uh, what, what, what am I leaving out? I'm a dad. He's a dad. Great job. babies. You know what I mean? Paying some child support. I mean, he have sex. You know what I mean? <laughs> Just out there humping. You know what I mean? I'm a lover. Word up. Y'all make some noise again for Killer Mike, ladies and gentlemen. Good hands, good hands. That's so Mike, um, thank you for, for joining us and being here. I definitely wanted to start the conversation with um, where we are, I mean, Symphonic with this company, you know, with, with digital, with streaming, with, where music is right now, and so many different avenues and platforms and ways to get your music out. Um, talk to the people real quick just about your career and how much things have changed since you started with the major, moving independent, and just where you see the business right now. Um. I I you know I don't want to get too preachy. I'll just give you my experiences. So I get a record deal, and my experience can best be described as one half of my first album was recorded on two inch reel, and with two inch reel, if you wanted to ad lib or you made a mistake, you would have to stop. Someone would have to run outside, and in turn would have to cut the tape. Pray cut to it. God he didn't do it wrong. Right. Piece it back together so he didn't get cursed out and beat up in the studio. And then about 20 minutes later, you'd be able to go back in, finish your ad lib of the record, right? So one half of my record. The other half was recorded on this brand new thing called Pro Tools that was taken where if you fucked up, you could just say, hold on, take it back, do it on another track, and you could be in the back like, wicked! And then the next thing you know, 15 years removed, you got my homeboys, the dope-ass ad lib group, and Fierce Lyricist Amigos, right. who took something like Pro Tools and created a whole new wave of how to, how to rock. So my career was half between the old guard and half between the new. So I got him out on a major label, Columbia. Um, I was signed under a smaller label that was owned by some other musicians. It was called Equimini, it was Outkast. It taught me first. Never heard of him. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> so I get signed by the world's greatest rap group and people like me, Janelle Monet, um, you know, Rock D, get our shot. And we're, we get an opportunity to get our shot right at a time where the rap audience was kind of over people putting their crews on. You know, so it was like, after you got Jay and State Property and Cam and the Dips, it was like, all right, motherfucker, we don't need no more. We got the, the creme de la creme, you know, Snoop and the East Siders, West Side Connects. You had that, but now you had the sentiment of, hey, I feel like I'm as good as. So it was the first wave of kind of do-it-yourselfers. So people took their mixtapes to the streets and to the gas stations. And I got tired of major label bullshit within maybe one, two years. I was like, fuck this shit, I'm out. So after Outkast left Columbia, they attempted to go to Virgin, and I just didn't want to be there. I didn't want to be told to do, I didn't want to be told what was a hit record. And me and my little crew um, called Grind Time jumped out, made an independent tape. Um, we went down to Texas, got schooled by people like Paul Wall and Chameleon Air. We got schooled by people like the Grit Boys, you know what I'm saying? Shouts out to Ace Town, <laughs> yeah, I mean. rest in peace to DJ Screw. For sure. Um, we got taught in Texas by people like Slim Thug, people like Hump, you know, T Ferris, how to put out a record independently and not treat it like a mixtape, but treat it like an underground album. And me and my crew, um, one of which was fresh out of high school then, he's a kid named Cuz Lightyear, y'all may have heard of him. What up, Cuz? And he be rapping his ass off since then. And he has worked tirelessly independently to, to become what he is now. And that's a growing star over at Mass Appeals um, label. The other one was a kid who was, got signed later to MMG, um, was called Peel, and he was a um, XXL freshman a few years back. So we set out on our own path, on grind time, I pledge allegiance to the grind one, two, and three. And those marginally plateaued me, really kept me from sinking into the abyss of what happened to him. But on the mixtape scene, on the tastemaker scene, on the kids that were going to underground bars like Smith's Old Bar in the basement in Atlanta, we were performing in front of these three, 500 people <coughs> rooms. But those were the kids that became the cornerstone of what was Killer Mike as the Pledge series, what was Killer Mike as rap music, which I released with William Street, we'll get to that, and what is Killer Mike as one half of Run the Jewels. Pledge three, <coughs> pledge one and two increased who I was outside of 
in proxy to. I started my career in proxy to Outkast, right? I was, I was an addition to them. I was dope. I showed up on records. I wrapped my ass off. So whether it was popping tags to the whole world, or Funkanella, you knew that that kid had something. So I showed I was worthy. <laughs> but it wasn't until I set out on my own that I got to show that I knew what I was doing and I could define something for myself. Um, Pledge 1 and 2 set me up for that. Pledge 3 brought me back into um, a label, but it was independent still. It was Grand Hustle Records. Tip was a good friend of mine and had just seen me work my butt off to make some underground significance in the markets we were bit getting, you know, like Fat Beat sold me up here. We were good in the South and Midwest, um, and we were trying to push west westward, Texas and beyond. And he, he gave me a deal for Pledge 3. Pledge 3 was recorded at a wonderful recording facility, a more like a family called Tree Sound down in Atlanta, thanks to Molly and Groove. It's the same way Dreamville just went and lived in that studio and right, just recorded right, right. that whole dope ass record. Shouts out to Earth Gang. Um, I just lived in that motherfucker by myself, me and Dula, and we made Pledge 3. And that guy, a guy named Jason DeMarco, who was a friend of me and a guy who had a label called Def Jux. Um, his name was LP. Um, that he was a friend of both of ours. LP was a music producer, and I feel like he's the greatest producer rapper for real, because I see him mm. make his own beats, and I see him write his own raps. You know what I'm saying? Um, and we d knew of each other in the peripheral, but we didn't know of each other. Right. And I can say that I had spent time, at that point, seven, eight years, trying to find a sound, trying to define my identity, trying to show who I was, or, or trying to be reflective of the things that had inspired me. So I'm inspired by Public Enemy, I'm inspired by Ice Cube, I'm inspired by BDP, and I'm also inspired by Luke and the Two Live Crew. You know, I'm inspired by DJ Jimmy. I'm inspired by Farside, the alcoholics. Like, I'm a hip hop head, but I hadn't found the sound. Jason said, I want you, Mike, to come to William Street Records, sign for one record, we're gonna give you, you know, for where you're on the mixtape side, a grotesque amount of money to make a record. You know, it wasn't big money to them, but at the time, I'm like, shit, this takes all the pressure out of me having to go press up tapes, right. hit the circuit, because right. at that time, you were taking your tapes to record stores. Really so out there, really down on the road, Texas, right. we would drive down to Texas, buy our shit, get it pressed up, and on the way back from Texas, drop it off in states. Maybe you know what stops. I mean? That's how the grind time mixtape mm -hmm. started. So it gave me an opportunity to get back, put on shelves, and focus on just promoting and getting out. And he put me in a room with a guy named LP, who he thought we could make dope shit together. And within the first three hours, we made three records. We started three records, and I called Jason like, this guy has to do my whole album. I was like, I found my bomb squad. Like, well, I am 1989 Ice Cube. <laughs> <laughs> Were you familiar with Cold Flow at all before then? Yes, I was. Okay. Um, Cannibal Ox actually was a okay, was, was, was the fame, like, in terms of the sounds he had created. Company Flow was like, oh, yeah, it's dope. Shit, this, is my, this, this scratches my East Coast itch. But the Cannibal Ox shit was something deeper, darker. Yes, yes. Dare I say, um, soulful. You know what I'm saying? It was a deeper, darker criminal link. <laughs> yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> So I, I knew I, again, in the peripheral, you know, your peripheral, right. you can see it. Yeah. Like I knew my wife was beautiful in there, but when I saw her, like, oh, shit, where you been all, you know? <laughs> and that's what it was. When I got on the LPB, it was like, this is a marriage. This is what I'm supposed to do. So LP and I go out on tour, and he does a record on my record. I do a record on his record. His record drops a week before my record. Um, it looks like a beautiful plan that happened just to be serendipity. We didn't know we were going to make beautiful music together. Our friend Jason somehow knew that. We didn't know the companies were going to put our records out in opposition to each other. Within a week apart, you know, it's damn near like you're sabotaging each other as an artist. Right. But the companies thought what they thought. By then, we had become friends. And by then, we were like, fuck it. We're just going to goddamn tour together. Mm -hmm. So we went out on tour together, and we each had a song on each other's record. And we'd come out, and there were LPs fans, and there were Killer Mike fans, and they were agreeing to come out and party together and see two of their favorite MCs. We come rock, and then when we got on stage together and did each other's records, the crowd was a little more amped. And there'd always be these younger kids there who I had no idea who the fuck they were. I was like, who the kids the goddamn ex? Is that a gang or something? And and then, <laughs> you know, black clubs don't really do the straight edge of the South. If right. you make it in the club, you're getting drunk. You know what I'm right, saying? Right, right, right. You know, that motherfucker's 16, he snuck in here, he drunk. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you about it later. I got slipped a woo-woo joint one time in the strip club. I had to call my mom at 16. Like, I'm having a heart attack. Say, nigga, you just smoke crack. <laughs> <laughs> uh -oh. You got to save that for the book. Save yeah. it for the book, buddy. <laughs> so we, we, and these kids would get more hyped on those two records. So, okay, get back. L, um, L has a mixtape due, right? He has a mixtape he has to turn in. It takes him a long time to write. Um, at the time, it was, he was putting out a record like every five years. And I was like, yo, 
I had such a good time making rap music with you. People have received the records we did on his album, which was Cancer for Cure, and mine was rap music. I was like, shit, I'll come do the mixtape with you. He was like, you sure? It's like, there's no money in it. I was like, I don't give a fuck. Like, let's rock. You know what I mean? So I went up. We did like five, six records. We sent them to Jason and um, Taco, who co-produces on the LP, I um, mean, on the um, Run the Jewels joints. And they both called us back like, if you guys don't do a whole tape and call it an album, you guys are stupid. And nobody wants to be stupid. Um, <laughs> so we finished it. And we put out Run the Jewels 1. And then we went out as LP and Killer Mike, and we opened for Run the Jewels group. So I would go out, rock, Killer Mike fans are like, <sighs> LP fans are like, all right, we fuck with you, man. We like rap music. And then LP would come out, and it was like, LP fans go, hey, and Killer Mike fans are like, all right, why, man, why, why are we rapping this ass off? <laughs> and then we come back out together. And it always be this little section. So if you take from that white purse there, the LP Killer Mike fans are here, but that white purse there would just be these young kids, <laughs> same kids with the X. Mm -hmm. And they wouldn't, you know, doing the LP and Killer Mike, it's like, OK, old, old guys moving and rapping. Right. Cool. Are we like that. That reminds me of some, yeah. But when we came back out as the same two dudes, all we did was change our sweaty T-shirts and come back out, those kids would lose their fucking minds. Crazy. And the whole place. Crazy. All the LP Killer Mike fans, who at that point were late 20s, early 30s, became 17-year-old kids who were fans of Wu-Tang, who were fans of Outkast, who were fans of Tribe and Dayla and shit again. And then they lost their fucking minds. And at the end of that tour, I remember my manager, Joe, um, Joe Will and Amici, our, our management team, I remember Joe saying, um, so what, we gonna go back and work on another solo album? I was like, nah, I'm nah. in a fucking group, I see, huh? I see what's going on out <laughs> yeah, here. I was like, this is a group, nigga. What is this, a solo? Right. What's a solo? What's a solo? Did you, <laughs> you, know I mean? did you not just see what happened? You know what I mean? And man, me and L had so much fun. And that little third of the audience provided us with so much inspiration. We went in and we did Run the Jewels too. And I remember being in California in Alchemist's studio. And after you, you know, you know after you... Like, like, luck is the meeting of preparation and opportunity, Absolutely. right? But after you get lucky, you doubt the shit out of yourself sometimes. You're like, oh, shit. Can you do it again? They're like, we got right. lucky. Right. And the amazing thing was on the first one, it was a mixtape, so we gave it away. We gave it away because we were like, we'll tour, we'll sell some T-shirts, and we'll have a good year, and we did. But after getting lucky, you got to go back in like, I got to do this shit again? Right. And I remember going in and... L kind of had that because he's a producer. The pressure is on the beat maker. You know what I mean? I, you got to give, you got to get that. That boy been making dope beats a long That's time. That's a fact. You know what I'm saying? And I, what you hear at the front of two with me screaming at L, like a fucking boxing trainer, like my trainer is going to scream at me Saturday morning. Like, that's really how that record started. Like, we are the fucking best. I don't give a fuck. And that's what the fuck I meant. And we carried that attitude directly through that album. And we went back out on tour. And those kids became a room. So they brought we, more kids. Yeah, that shit went from three to 500 with a third of those kids to we showing up. And all of a sudden, the people who are me and L's age are up in the rafters. Right. Right? And they like, hey, man, we had fun that last go round, but shit, we up here drinking beer. Yeah, we're going to sit down. It. So now the whole floor, now we're up to 1,000, 1,500. Now the whole floor is those kids. And those kids, I'm saying those kids, to give you some context, my daughter was in high school and getting aggravated that people were asking her about her T-shirt and about getting a T-shirt. My son was um, just coming out of high school at that point, and he was like, oh, my fucking God, my dad happens to be in the coolest. Because my son is into, like, nerd rap shit. Like, he knows the groups three years before they come out. Like, he, he, he put me on the Kendrick. Mm -hmm. You know, he put me on to Earth Gang. Okay. He put, you know right, what I mean? Right. Like, he, he called me last year like, Dad, I won't do or die for my birthday. Mm. I almost cried. Like, it's my nigga. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Those like, I used to ride around us. in the Apollo, right. man. Uh, let's rap the ice cube. I just looked up like, Lord. Lord, thank you, Lord. Thank you, man. You know what I mean? So, you know, th when I start realizing, oh, shit, this is our audience, too. We, we toured even harder. We went more relentlessly. We went across the pond. We slept in cheap European hotels with one bathroom for six rooms. And, and we put in the groundwork. And somewhere in between two and three, we became what I saw the people who brought me into the game became. Outcast is a rap group that became a band. And I don't mean that as in a, I don't want to be a rap group kind of way. That's not what I mean. I mm -hmm. mean, I, Elle and I are of the age where we grew up and we saw rap groups play arenas. Right. 
So I saw Run DMC live. I saw Beastie Boys live. I saw LL Cool J live. Luke and the Two Live Crew live. NWA live. And I saw them in huge arenas. Right. And that's what I always wanted and dreamed of. And somewhere between two and three, we start marching that way. You march up to three, we're doing eight to 10,000 people rooms. You know, we're doing amphitheaters. We're opening for Lord. We're opening for Jack White, you know, and it's been a blessing, but it was not the way that I thought it'd be. You know, I thought it went the traditional way. I thought you got on a big label, you figured out a hokey ass single, you made it work. The rest of your album was pure fire, fire, bomba clots, I'm the best. And the next thing you know, you're the man and it doesn't. It works right. out more like my heroes have worked out. And as you get your ass out there, you perform in front of the people that deserve the performance because they've supported your music. Right. You leave your blood, sweat, and tears on that stage. And if you do that often enough for the right people with the right humility and attitude and dope ass records, first and foremost, that crowd is gonna grow. So Run the Jewels has grown from a friendship and a kinship into a rap group with audience into truly a beyond band, a community of people. When we Absolutely. started seeing kids go up on Instagram and on Twitter, climbing mountains and throwing up the Run The Jewels logo. Like I can remember when L first threw the name around, I was like, let me sleep on it. But I hung up the phone like, boy, that white boy, boy that nigga yeah, small. Run the jewels. <laughs> like, because it's, it's an it's a old term. Like it's an old term, we sitting on the subway, motherfuckers just come sit next to you and run it. And you just run know like, jewels. I just got fucking This wrong. is still New York, yeah. right? Y'all understand. Yeah. You know what I mean? Run The Jewels. So, the next day I called him like, it's dope. And then he sent me a picture of his hands. And I'm just like, oh, that's it. Like, that, that's us. Nick, Nick Gazin um, illustrated it for us. And I knew the first time I laid eyes on it. I'm like, yo, this is the Rolling Stones lips and tongue. This is, you know, outcast ca reimagination Iconic. of the outcast. Right. Oh, this is Wu Tang W. This is us. Like, we, we, we have something. And what we have has grown into a community and culture. Because like I say, race car drivers, drifters are just like, Mike, can we just throw your logo up on our what's the name? So you got kids that are in the drifting, kids that are in the lifting, running, kids that are climbing mountains, kids that are catching fucking sharks. And they throwing up running jewels. I put up on my IG page, some guy won a $162 million smoker or tobacco lawsuit in Florida. This guy literally looks like he gives to the police organizations every month. What the, <laughs> what the fuck? After he won, the first thing he can think of to do, because, I mean, that's just, you know, my prejudice right, coming to right. it. <laughs> but with what he, the first thing he can think of to do when he takes his official I kick Big Tobacco's ass picture. Run the jewels. He did that shit, man. I put that shit up and call all my black friends. I will have white friends. <laughs> you know I mean? No way you will shame me. And you, that just shows the culture of us being an underdog and the right. culture of the friendship and love that I have gave us a raw and powerful music. And it gave us raw and powerful lyricism. And it gave us, it gave our audience something that they needed or wanted. Yeah. To the point where some of my most memorable moments as being a Run the Jewels member. Um, Cause second to probably being Shay's husband. That's my, my proudest. You know, you know what I mean? Like, I, I love her. My kids, I tell them you're an investment. I'm going to wait a couple years. Here right, right. We'll see how this, this, you know I mean? how this pans out. I don't want to be like, man, it's a proud thing. Next thing you know, this little motherfucker that killed so Oh, Lord, have mercy. Don't I do it. I really to. never like him anyway. You know what I'm saying? I knew he was all right. You know? But I, um, be, like, it's having parents come out and say, my son had to see this as a first concert. My daughter had to experience this. So now I'm bringing... 34 and 44 year old men and their 14, 15, 16, 17 year old children to my show. And that means something to me Absolutely. because I grew up, you know, my, thanks to my, my, you know, I have a bio and a non bio dad. And my, you know, my, I'm close with both of them. Both my dads, I love them to death, which means I spend a lot of money on Father's Day. But <laughs> um, my non bio dad just let me as, have his records. He literally just gave me his records to fuck up, to want to be a DJ and scratch up and shit. And, um, you know, I just appreciate it because he gave me that love of music in a different way. You know, the reason I love, you know, Parliament, the reason I love Zeppelin, the reason that, you know, I knew it was more mature than a lot of my friends, the reason I listen to Queens because my dad, you know what I mean? So knowing that a dad purposefully brings their children to our shows, you know, I think that, you know, it, mean, it, meant, you know, it means a lot to me. Like I called yesterday to curse my son out because he, he didn't tell me about the Goody Mob show. I slept through it. I was pissed the fuck off. Like you're a bad son, you're horrible. <laughs> <laughs> and that's that those are the things though. So in, in our attempt to just make dope music together, we built a friendship. And in building a friendship, we built a kinship that creates more dope music. 
and the demands that we put on ourselves, besides being authentically hip hop and dope, is that if we're really gonna call ourselves a rap group, we have to put out four records. EPMD put out four classic records. Mm. Outcast put out four classic mm. records. Tribe, De La, classic records, BM, um, Beastie Boys. Mm -hmm. So we had, we're just now, after this record drops, you know, when now you officially a group. Now we'll be, now you know. <laughs> Mike, I want, yes, clap it up for that. Thank I mean, <laughs> one thing about you, Mike, that I've always admired is that you're such a student of the game. Like, it's obvious. Um, as somebody who's just a dope MC is that you listen to a lot of dope music, that you listen to a lot of dope artists, and that you had um, different taste in music, not just listening to rap. Um, talk to me about your dreams as a kid to become a rapper and the journey or the twist and turn that your story took. Because now you are heralded as one of the dopest MCs, and outside of being a dope MC, your, your, um, your persona, who you are as a figure, is, is huger than, I think, just music. But again, you know, you went through the bad deal initially. You walked away from another deal, what a lot of people wouldn't do, you know. And I, I think I heard or read somewhere that, um, you know, you love rap, but it had broke your heart at one point. Yeah, and yeah. I didn't walk from a bad deal. I walked from a bad experience. Outcasts are some of the most fair and generous businessmen mm -hmm. I've ever met. Ti is a fair and, and generous businessman, so I didn't walk away from a bad deal. I walked away from a bad culture. Gotcha. I just don't like certain cultures and certain records. And it did not that it's not good, it didn't work for me. I mm -hmm. love Three Six Mafia on Columbia Records. Mm -hmm. I want more and more of Juicy Fucking J. Mm -hmm. I want Juicy to run their black department one day. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. I just, it didn't work for me because what I was trying to do just what didn't work for them. Right. And it was easier. So I don't ever want to say bad business in terms of outcasts because they're not. They're not bad businessmen. They're fair and ethical. They, you know, they don't do shit like buy your publishing. They ain't try to push right. you in. Or a, a situation like, that didn't yeah, work for yeah, you. Exactly. Right. And the next situation, I was just scared of. You know, shit. You know, you know, you date a whoish person, you just be scared to date again. You know what I'm saying? So, <laughs> were you were you were you willing to walk away? Because when you walk away from a record deal, yeah. which is something that most people are aspiring toward, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, when you walk away, was that your way of also saying that maybe you'd be walking away from music, or did you always know that no, you had another no, route? No, 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 because I, I was too lazy to work, and cocaine was not fashionable to sell anymore. So for me, since I couldn't join BMF and I didn't want to work a real job, I just figured maybe I should keep pushing. But going to Texas changed my life. You know, going to Texas and meeting, well, Lil Flip, meeting Lil Flip, first meeting Flip and him and Hump being so generous in terms of the information that they shared. And then him and one of my friends got in really bad beef. And, um, you know. That's, that's always just, uncomfortable. Yeah. You know, you just kind of sit there like, damn. Can't be your friend no more. Damn it. You know what I'm saying? So that flip kind of went through that, but the knowledge he had given me had made me say, I got to go to Texas. And I went, man, I'll never forget Paul Wall, Chameleon Air, Scooby from the Grit Boys, Kalyon, like all those boys just being open, you know what I'm saying, and really just sharing the game. And that's when I understood I could make money doing this, so what, what did I really need a record company for? And at first, it was just to figure it out. You know what I'm saying? I just needed to figure it out because at, at the biggest rap group you in the world. You got them fainting, Mike. You got them fainting out here. <laughs> the biggest rap group in the world as a fan, in, in my eyes, was breaking up. So that was breaking my heart, you know, with right. Outkast. And they weren't breaking up as much as Dre was, you know, pursuing other shit. Shouts out to my nigga playing flutes on y'all. Um, <laughs> And I, it was just like amongst homies and peers and big brothers confusion. So it just gave me time to do that. And then I like it. You know, I started liking the, 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 you know, the process of it. You know, you know Empire, we were, they were early on supporters of us and helping us get our mixtapes and stuff out. So I enjoyed the process until, until I didn't anymore. And then I, I went, to, went back around the label route with, with Tiff and with Williams. And since I had more control, I enjoyed it more. And LP and I, the most radical thing that we've been told we did was just give music out for free. Right. After the first mixtape did what it did for us in terms of touring and merchandising, we would have been fools to then come around and take that third of the audience and say, ha ha, now we're charging right. you for Got it. Got you, duped you. Yeah, you know, right. I thought that L and I both, I can remember us telling management that and fucking, they were just like, oh, okay. Um, we can't sell these. Okay. Right. You know what I'm saying? Because right. they got to go back and tell the distributor that. Right. Hey, by the way, guys, yeah, fool, I think it was Fool's Gold at the time. Uh, it was either Fool's Gold or Massfield. Just like the guys yeah, want to give this one. shit right. away. And they'll just be like, what the fuck? And I remember we were in Alabama. We had a show in fucking Alabama, all places. I think Birmingham. I think we, they had a bootleg copy or something had 
found his way to some whatever nerd hip hop shit because our DJ Shaq, that's a that's a shade at Trackstar. Trackstar, our DJ, who I love, um, is fucking is a he's 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 a battle rap fucking expert. He knows all things nerd and hip hop. And somehow I think he discovered that our shit was up. So I mean they were like just fuck it, we're dropping it. I think it was like Halloween maybe or something. We were right. like we dropped it. And that's how we got the press to get it dropped. We dropped it and and it ignited. Like run the jewels to ignite it. And poof, those kids went out, not only came and supported our shows and put us in bigger venues, I can remember getting the calls where, like, guys were going to have to do a venue change. And I was like, what the fuck? Like, nobody bought tickets? They're like, no, guys. You know, everybody they, bought they, tickets. They, like, it doubled. Right. You know, like, it doubled in size. And that's when I'm starting to like, oh, shit, this is serious. And, you know, you come back around to three, and, and you're opening for Lord. You know what I'm saying? And you're doing, you're doing 100,000 people at right. festivals and um. In, in the UK, you're doing Lollapalooza. And, right. and it's just, it's been an amazing experience. But again, it, it, I think that it's always possible to get a hit out of nowhere. It's always possible to luck up and do some dope ass shit and get lucky. Just make sure you put the preparation in because then the work happens. And, right. you know, be prepared for the work. Like, enjoy it. Like, I didn't want to be a rapper. I wanted to be a break dancer. Let me tell you. <laughs> <laughs> let me tell you. Let me tell you. Let me tell you. You guys got the linoleum? Was, Bring it. You guys was, ready? There was once. We got a surprise was, for you, Mike. There was, once a, there was a once a 12-year-old boy who wore a 34 Husky. <laughs> and all he wanted to do was backspin. That's all in the world he wanted to do. And God said, nope, nope, chubby wubby. Nope, we're not going to do that. You can do the worm, you can pop lock, you can do the rerun, but there'll be no backspinning for you. You're a talker, you're gonna talk. So to stay involved in hip hop, you, I, I had to do something, so I figured out rapping, and it's brought me here. So for me, you know, the journey has been enjoying the process. So if the first record doesn't write, work, do a second one, and a third one, and a fourth one, and a fifth one. That's something I learned from, you know, being in the studio with people like Gucci, you know, early on, like Gucci was on, um, I think Pledge 3, and I was on, he, he, Gucci was like the first person to put me on a record with Drake. He was like, man, I got this record, they got this record key I want you to do for me. And I was like, cool. I just went, he's like, yeah, I'm going to uh, uh, Drake on it. I was just like, nigga, you put me on a record with Drake? <laughs> and you know, Gucci, Thank you. what I learned, what I loved about what was, because I, I was early, I fucked with Drake, so my shit was just, I was tripping that he put me on with somebody that, I love Watt because he always, his ear was just always, he just liked what he liked. Absolutely. And it was dope. And he's probably helped more kids from my city just get on, you know for what I'm sure. saying? Just on that on good faith. So I've always respected and admired him for that, and 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 love. So I, but I saw how hard he worked. So my shit was just just keep working hard because I saw the whole industry try to shit on him and mm -hmm. get him out. And I was like, if I know if I keep working, I get a break. And it was times I wanted to quit. I was like, man, fuck this shit. I might need to take up this Christianity thing and fool people out of their money and be a preacher. <laughs> no one's ever my, done that my before. Wife was like, my wife was like, no, nigga, no. <laughs> You're gonna rap. We gotta thank We're Shane Bigger. We're gonna get on We gotta Sundays. thank Shane Bigger for so many things. <laughs> yeah. So many things he's brought. Oh, so many times we left the fucking strip club and went to Ebenezer Baptist Church. High <laughs> as fuck. Just, just like, Lord, forgive us. Right. Mike, talk, talk to me about the importance. Uh, <laughs> true. They know the story is true, too. It's real out here. <laughs> talk to me about the importance of, of independence and really, you know, being able to manifest your own destiny and having the in, power in your hands. In, in, independence matter. What I admire about what you guys are doing now is you're, you're not waiting. There was a time you kind of had to turn in a song, wait on people to tell you what they thought, get their opinions and things of that nature, and then wait on a system to tell you you could get it out. The cool thing about what you guys have been able to do as producers and MCs and singers and shit is to just do it. You know, using social media and using ex, ex, um, alternative and expert social skills, meaning you used to have to get in a big club or a big venue. You used to have to wait right. for a bigger group to ordain you worthy. You ain't want to be too good because then if you're too good, they won't let you yeah, open. Yeah, yeah, they won't fuck nah, with you. Now you can get your own little three to 500 people space, serve coffee, call that shit coffee and cocaine, and do a, do a, do a goddamn amazing set. And the next thing you know, those people are taking it to social media. You have a marching street team. I love that about you guys. I also love the fact that you guys are risk takers. You'll make 40 records to find the four. Like, I love the fact that her never showed your fucking face. At first, she's like, man, fuck you. Like, listen to my music. Listen to the music. Learn to love my music, and then I'm going to show up, and you're going to motherfucking love me. And she was absolutely right about right. that. You know, I love the scissor kept pushing until you got it. You was like, oh, this is who made all those rap records I've been in love with exactly. who made me love them more. I love the fact that in the South, 
we have kind of, even without acknowledging or saying it, we've always considered female MCs powerful. You couldn't have a rap crew if you didn't have a girl MCs, whether right. it was Mia X, whether it was Trina, you know what I'm saying? Fucking Gangster Boo, one of the hardest fucking rappers ever. Shout you know what I'm saying? Like, sure. like Triple Six Mafia and Boo in particular deserve credit for all the flows and patterns maybe for the last two, three years. Talk about so, it. you know, you, you, you get that. And I'm just like, you know, shit, this is prime, prime environment. If... You guys have an opportunity to plug in directly with your audience and build them like a tiny church. But then become a movement. And the next thing you know, you're doing it. And all it takes is patience per and perseverance and the ability to keep adjusting and keep pushing forward. Um, a good friend of mine is Brian Koppelman, who is the writer and creator of the show Billions. If you guys don't follow him, follow him. Because every day, he writes something to push other writers, mm -hmm. to push past your fear, past your doubt, past whatever you think perception is. He's going to tell you, some of the shit you're going to write is going to be garbage. Now it's going to be good. It's not going to be, but you got to keep at it. And then I realized in music, that's really all I did. That's all I was encouraged to do from my wife and my friends, my family, from my homeboys and fellow MCs was just keep rapping, keep, keep doing dope stuff. So, you know, Outkast has a DJ. His name is Cutmaster Swift. And he's like a big brother to all of us. And he spends about 60% of his time shitting on us. Like, that's like big brothers do. Like, ah, uh, nigga, nigga, fuck a flute. Nigga, rap. Right. You know what I'm saying? Right. Like, you know what I'm saying? Killer Mike, what the fuck you sitting here down yourself for? Nigga, rap. Like, and that's like, that's, uh, he'll curse you out. It's like Dick Gregory on, on DJ. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and many times that, that is just the plain truth of it. You know what I mean? You guys are creatives. You guys are blessed to be able to look at thin air and see creation. You know, you guys have it's what, what, like everybody agrees to a system of rules. You know, everybody agrees to rent. Everybody agrees to mortgage. Everybody agrees to jobs. Everybody agrees to high learning. Everybody agrees to, creatives look at and say, well, why? Right. Or why not? And out of thin air, you create things that change people's mood. You create things, you know, when I look at general society, whether it is the woke folks or the folks at Fox or whoever, try to tear down artists, I always used to wonder why, like, what the fuck they always talk about rappers and right. singers and that. It's because you have the greatest amount of influence in an instance. In three minutes, you can change a person's total perspective. You can change an entire perspective in two and a half to three minutes. Absolutely. You know, simply you direct the energy in a room and use all these tools you have. Yes, it's hard to get people to listen to you. No, you should not be fucking with 50 when he's on a movie date. <laughs> I had a you whole know, I, mean, I had a whole conversation you, you, you with people about you that. Shouldn't do that. I was like that you was not the right time. Because he was on a date. And when you're on a date, you don't want an asshole trying to sell you water. With your like, man with the camera. Yeah, like, yeah, like that's maybe just he was not trying to right. be but it would have been cool to say, yo, Phil, I'm a DM something, bro. Please. You know, you know what I mean? It would have been cool to say, I'm gonna get a hundred people to at you, just listen if they at you. We, you know what I mean? Before I had to do some Atlanta shit, I was home for one day, so I went to the Waffle House, got some cheese eggs with Swift last night, right? And girl walks up, and she says, well, I manage some folks. Now she managed, she's working at the Waffle House. And I'm just like, okay, here it goes. <laughs> here it goes, fucking little Nuke Nuke's auntie and fucking young Nuke's gonna rap about selling cocaine and killing people, not in a good way. Like, cause, I want to hear my cocaine and killing people clever. You know what I'm saying? Please be, please be so, clever with the coke. Uh, uh, no, nah, I mean, even like, you know, it's like, you got to be little baby. You can't be little baby 13, no, no. You know what I mean? I want, I want my baby version of little baby. Give me goddamn West Side. But she said, this other girl sang there. And I knew the other, the other young lady was, had danced, and she had came in from work one time. She had dance rehearsals. And I just told her, you know, instead of trying to play it on your phone, she's trying to play the phone, I said, he's an A&R, for real. Get his email address and send it to him and ask his social media and send it to him. So as I go home, well, I don't go home. I go back around to Swift's house. I'm smoking a joint. We're talking to shit. I just say, man, let me I say, play the record. And play the record, and the girl can sing her fucking ass off. She really can sing, and she can dance. And that happened because she was prepared when the moment came. Now, we've gotten high, smoked weed, went to that Waffle House fucking a dozen times, you know, in the past few months. And... When the opportunity presented itself, she was on deck and she was ready. Right. You know what I'm saying? Right. She wasn't obnoxious or an asshole about it. She was humble. You know what I'm saying? She didn't even have to give them no extra eggs. But, <laughs> but she, at, at the very least, she's going to get an opportunity to sing background on something. Dope. That'll leave her an opportunity to, to, to be presented in the world in a bigger way in these things. So you just got to see opportunity, too. A lot Absolutely. of times when doors were closed, like I saw a lot of my friends go platinum and gold. And I remember... Um, 
being told that at Columbia, like, you know, your profit and law, your PL sheet is great. Like, you know, you didn't go platinum, but you made us some money. So that's about it, big dog. We're gonna divert the rest of your money on over to Vivian Green. <laughs> I was like, God damn, I wow. like Viv, but shit, I right. wanted my I wanted to go platinum in right. the meantime, you know, my friends are people like Outcast and fucking TI in the game. Right. And I was like, God damn, these niggas cars getting bigger. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I still in the 95 Apollo on D's. But Keep them clean, though. Yeah, oh, man, park that bitch right next to your role voice. I ain't getting more attention. Um, Because I'm from the country. <laughs> I, um, you know, I just, I just, I knew it was going to take me a longer time. I knew it was going to be a, a protracted struggle, but I knew I had dope. So when me and LP put the dope together, it's been dope ever since. And our dedication is to continually bring better music and, to, to, and our focus is playing bigger crowds. I want to have a 20-year career. I want to go in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Right. I want to win Grammys. Rolling Stone you know, shit. We'll probably have a couple records that'll go gold before the end of the year. You know, I want, I want that. I, I told L earlier, I said, I want to be the ACDC of this shit. Mm -hmm. Like, I feel like I saw Run the Jewels the first time we were in the studio together. Mm -hmm. you know? And, is, and you have to make the world see what's in your head. Right about you and, and, and keep refining it and making it dope. For sure. And it's manifested into, I guess, like that dream that you have as a kid to be a rap star and sell out, you know, arenas and stadiums and things like that. You know, you might not know the route that you're going to take to get there. You might not know about all the twists and turns that come with it, but yeah. you, you got there. Um, talk to me about the importance of, because one thing I know and I love about uh, RTJ is the merchandise and yeah. the syncs and licenses. I mean, yeah, every movie, video game, they gave me a they gave me a a, a video game that had a run the jewels logo t-shirt and all. <laughs> I'm like, yo, this is amazing in every game. And you know what I'm saying? Like even people who might not even be up on the music or know who you guys are, but love gaming. You know, just talk to me about the importance of being able to have music that you can license and sync and, and for the, the people that might not really understand what that is, what it is. Well, licensing and syncing is like when movies, like movies are cool, right? But if you ever watch a movie without sound, you can stop watching the movie. So if you're at home, you just put on a movie and you hit mute. If the movie's not truly captivating, it'll kind of lose you, right? So sound is put in movies to attract your attention, right? Batman suits in a rope. Zoop, boom, from the score. But then there are times where they need to advertise the movie or they need a song to, to make a certain scene memorable. We just happen to make a music, even though, even though we're fucking chubby pudgy as fuck, our music for some reason is energetic as shit. Our stage show is live as shit. And people who are into syncing and movies started to say this music fits with this scene. And hence you get Run the Jewels over the Black Panther um, Lexus commercial. You get Run the Jewels on a bunch of Netflix shit. You get Run the Jewels and Baby Driver. Um, you know, you get us because- Love our, that movie. Thank you. Our music, I love that shit too. Um, our, our music is made to perform and performances. So th there's an energy that comes to it that makes companies like the Royalty Network, which is a publishing company, that I do my admin through. Lars over there has brought a lot of, a lot of, a lot of that in, and you know, and not just you know, Els, Els Pub Company has our managers go out and work actively with Saint people. So even if you can't get a record deal, there are always movies being made. There are always smaller and bigger budget movies being made that need good music. And you are good musicians. You know what I'm saying? You are talented writers and artists. And that may be your route into it. Like, you know, Swift, who I joke about, the outcast DJ being like our big brother, you know, I just thought Luther Vandross got fucking discovered. I didn't know Luther Vandross was producing and writing for other artists until Swift called me stupid and made me listen to those other artists. You know? <laughs> you guys have the opportunity to get in the game in a lot of different ways. Right. If you're in a place like Atlanta, it may not be probable that you can get on QC tomorrow. But it is very probable you can get a record on a Tyler Perry song uh, movie tomorrow because he's making 30 movies a fucking year. And they always need some dope music. You know, there are movies being made in Atlanta daily. They always need dope music. So I would say to start to the same way you would <laughs> know every A&R or beat down a manager's door, you need to start getting the publishing companies and sync companies yeah. and writing. And music you know, supervisors. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, I, I would do that. And... You know, I, 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 we've been fortunate in that, and we've also been fortunate in that we, the groups that we loved had strong merchandise. We loved Run DMC. Mm -hmm. So you've seen a hundred different versions of the Run DMC, the red bar with the white letters. You've seen a hundred different versions. Absolutely. We love the BC Boys. Absolutely. We love the Wu-Tang Clan. We love OutKast. You know what I mean? So for us, it was important with the Pistol and Fist 
especially after we saw kids just throwing it up. Again, we're watching kids literally climb mountains. We're watching wedding parties throw up that. So it was just like, why, why aren't we, or why would we not put it on every T-shirt that we could in the dopest way that we could possibly think? Because we're giving the music away. The music is still free. And it's a quiet deal that's been made. Like, just show up at the shows, buy a T-shirt if you want, you know? And it seems, to, it seems to work for us. I don't know what works for everybody, but I know I like swag. I know I like dope shit. And they have been bands where before I even, I never heard a kid's record in the second grade before I saw the Lunchbox. Right. Like, I saw the goddamn Lunchbox, and I'm just right. like, oh, I got to check this shit out. You know, that's what brought me to, you know, so I, th I believe in art. You know, people who follow me know I bullshit, doodle and shit, put it up on the internet, take pictures of toy cars. And we both care, Elle and I, about art. So even in the presentation of our album covers or our T-shirts, a lot of thought goes into it. So merch has been really good for us, and we think it's going to be better. I, would, I think that we have been um, overlooked a little. Um, really? Yeah. Double capacity. It, we should definitely have had a few sneaker collabs by now. I, we, I agree we, with that. We definitely should have at least had a Supreme T-shirt by now. I agree with that. You know, and that's not me begging for something. That's just saying... We cooler than you motherfuckers know, and you gonna know it on Run the Jews Folk. You know, I think you're gonna see all those things. Uh, I think that we're here to stay because we we did it our way. Absolutely. We, we, we truly didn't wait on a collab to come to us. We created our own. You know, we we in partnership with people like Daylight Curfew created our own culture. So you can get everything from a Run the Jews polo that you can wear at your golf tournament when you're fucking off with your friends who are lawyers who won a $162 million case, or you could wear a vintage Run the Jewel used piece of shit t-shirt that you've thrashed for 10 straight Run the Jewel shows that you happen to find in a consignment shop. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So I, I'm proud of that because the bands that I love, that's what they represent. Yeah, I mean, along with the music, I think the art work and the art is very important because it's visual. You know, the music is audio, the visuals is another component, yeah. you know, and they all work together. Um, talk to me about negotiating power. You know, a lot of artists out here, and even as you alluded to, you know, maybe trying to find a way onto a soundtrack or into a score of a movie or something like that. Um, what do you guys do? And how do you guys negotiate your deals um, as, as really successful artists, you know, but independent in your own right? You know, talk to me about some of those strategies. Well, Elle and I are a partnership, and, you know, when, when offers come or when we put something in the atmosphere, we talk, mm -hmm. you know, um, there's a commercial that wanted us. They wanted to pay us 100. We felt like we deserved 200. That commercial didn't get picked because they only thought we were worth 100. Same song got picked up for 250. You know, so you have to be, you have to have a bottom line mm -hmm. and you have to have an expectation. Mm -hmm. But I have to give a lot of credit to our management circle. When it comes to Joe, Will, and Amici, those guys are tough negotiators. So whether it's Joe in terms of live show, or Will in terms of syncing, or Meech in terms of um, licensing and things of that nature, our team cares about us and about getting us not only a maximum dollar, but leverage. You know what I'm saying? How do we get managed leverage? How do we make sure that, you know, it's, it's not a, like we did Banksy. Um, we did Banksy's Dismal Land. That was about more than, hey, you guys got paid, you got a Banksy piece. That was more about, that's a moment in time and a culture. And we had a team that understood that. So we're in fucking, you know, the cold ass Europe, you know, in the middle of nowhere, rocking like a motherfucker, because that's not gonna happen again. Banksy's not right. just gonna pop up, say, I'm gonna do right. Dismal Land every year, <clears throat> like it's Coachella, you know what I'm saying? So we have a team that understands the importance of money and they also understand the cultural importance that Ellen and I wanna leave too. Um, you know, whether it's our lawyers, whether it's our management, down to our tour manager and Christian Coffee, we just have an A1 team. So I don't think L or I could properly take full credit for that because we pay people to make sure our business is done and done well, and we creatively work our ass off to make sure that we give them the leverage they need to negotiate the type of deals that are going to be good for the team and circle we have. Important, important. And piggybacking right off of that, um, how does one select a team? Because... You know, you got your man, yo, my man, yo, I'm, a, I'm your manager, you know, yeah. but he want to be a rapper. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Yeah. Yo, I'm the photographer, but you always taking selfies. You know, how do you, how do you put to, because I tell people if I can give artists, I've been an independent artist for 13 years. If I could give anybody or when I give anybody, they ask me for advice, I say figure out who's who in your circle and build your team. Because team building, I think, is probably the most important thing Absolutely. for anybody that's trying to make it into this business. Absolutely. Um, so how do you select your team members? I tell young people now, like, even before you get a manager, I just work my ass off to get some buzz and get a publicist. You know, I get someone to help amplify the voice I have, even before a manager, because 
if a manager, if you haven't built enough following to have someone manage something, they're it's not nothing managing. Manage. There's nothing to manage. Yeah, you just have a caretaker. And then you're going to expect more of them than they can give. And if they have other clients, you're going to start to feel jealous and envious. It's only going to create tension and fighting. You know what I mean? If you amplify yourself to the best of your ability, and that could be 100 people. That could be 200 people. You know, who's your friend that's on all the gossip sites that actually has shade room, you know, respond to them or still on whatever hip hop sites around? Like, who's that friend? If that friend is not a publicist, then fuck it, you're going to publicize my ass to get it up to 1,000 likes. Right. And then you go get a professional publicist. And you have your friend work with and shadow your professional publicist. Because your professional publicist may have 5, 10, 18 different clients. But your point person is your point person. Mm -hmm. You know, and then pay the people that you're having to work and pay them fairly. You know, my managers, if they got to call me and ask about commission, it ain't because I fucked it up, it's because somebody working for me then. And then their ass getting fucking fired because I need my team paid because I need them alert and wanting to be on my shit. You know what I mean? I don't want, I don't want a team that's apathetic because they money coming late. So be willing to pay people who do the work and do it well. Because a lot of times as artists, you know, you count your dollars before they come in. The dollar you're making off touring, you know, if you tour, the goal is to bring home 50% of touring. So if you tour and you get a dollar every show, you get 50 cents every show. Right. You still owe that 20% to your manager, right. 15, you know, 10, 20, 15%. You're still going to owe that. So, you know, instead of saying, oh, I mean, I got 50 cents and now I got everybody want my no, just tell yourself, okay, out of the 50 cents, I know I got 30. Right. You know, because you know, you know that other monies are going to have to be paid. Like, I, when our road manager came back around, like, hey, guys, you know, it's time for a raise. We didn't argue with him, you know, because he's one of the best at it. You know what I'm saying? I told him if he leaves us for Donald Glover, I'm going to beat his fucking ass. <laughs> you know? Donald um, don't even be outside. You, you ain't got to worry about it. <laughs> But he's, he's, he's great, you know what I'm saying? So you got to be willing to pay the people. But as a young artist, even before I get a manager, I get a publicist. Because mm -hmm. I want somebody to publicize and amplify. And then the right manager is going to find you, right? right? Then you're sitting in the catbird seat and people are auditioning for you. You know what I mean? Like, we're going to have to hire someone soon on my team. So it's not hiring the first person you put in my lap. I got to see a few people. Right. You know, that puts you, that's the leverage. After you've proven yourself, you get an opportunity to say, well, let me see what's best for me. What's the best fit personality-wise? What's the best fit? What's most op optimal in terms of financial? You know, what's the best fit for where I need to be? Mm -hmm. um, if you have a friend that already shows talent and interest and hustle without you asking them to do it, then, then don't have a problem leaning on that friend. And when money starts to come in, don't have a problem compensating that friend. Important. And if that friend does not have some knowledge before you cut your friend off, you fire him, and you get rid of him, remember that's the person that was in the trenches with you and get that person trained up to the skill set. I heard little Jay say that. Little Jay said, you give me a loyal person mm -hmm. and I'll put them with someone to shadow to learn the job mm -hmm. because I know I'll have someone then who is loyal to me doing the job and that's loyal to our vision. That's real, you know? that's real. People don't realize how important, it's like any other relationship, you know, people that you choose to be in intimate with. You know, it's, a, it's a, just as important a relationship, if not even more important. Absolutely. So you definitely want to make sure that you got the right mate, if you will. Mike, talk to me about your longevity, your staying power, how you've been able to do what you do for so long and continue to take it to the next level. I mean, my, I got one mission when I wake up in the morning, you know what I mean? And that's to live to see another day. It's not the one and only, but... Probably the second mission in management, make sure you wrap your ass off today better than you did yesterday. You know, I, I can honestly say I'm still here because every single project I work my ass off to be better as a rapper. And that doesn't promise that things come out on the other side of that. But I think that the reason I'm still here is because like Bun B, like mm. Scarface, mm. like E-40, mm. you know what I mean? I, am, I want a 20, 30 year career. I do not want a flash in the pan. I do not want to be remembered for that one record. I want to be remembered in a constant for what I'm doing now. And as an MC, that's what I practice. Like, how do I outshine our last effort? You know, Run the Jewels goal is to be better than Run the Jewels 3, 2, and 1. You know, that's our goal. Our goal is not to, to give you what we've given you before and, and hope you like it. Our goal is to crush everything we've done before, you know, okay. and keep building on that legacy. So, so for me, it's about that. I want longevity. I want legacy. I, I aim for the stars. So even if I fuck up and hit the moon or Mars, I still made it still in outer space. What, so what keeps your pen sharp then, if that's the case? You know, what, 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 how do you stay dope? I'm competing with me. Like, you know, when you hear shit, like, imagine, man, you, you, like the, you, it's like, if you look at Tony Hawk, the first time he did a 1080, like, first time he went up and... I know he looked at that shit afterwards like, I'll be goddamn. <laughs> I did that shit. 
did that. And and on some rap shit, it's like that. Like I listen to old records, old Run the Jewels records. Like when I listen to Killer Mike God in the building, I was like, man, that motherfucker could rap. Like I want to be better than him. And that's one of my best records. When I listen to Killer Mike on Untitled, it's like, man, that motherfucker was flowing. And I want to be better than him. So I have to line myself. And then being in a rap group, the pen next to you could cut your throat at any moment. You know what I'm saying? Like, think about you, Fat Joe, probably walking in. Dead in the middle of Little Italy. We riddled some <laughs> middlemen who didn't know. Diddle. It's like I said, fuck you, fat boy, and just walked out the motherfucking room. Because you know he won the day. So, right. but, you know, steel sharpens steel. Absolutely. You know what I mean? So being in a group with L is another thing that keeps my skill level on par. And then I'm constantly listening to dope shit. Again, my son Malik, you know, my son Pony, my daughter Anaya, my daughter Mikey, they put me on the dope shit and music. Like, I, man, my little sis Smiley, first time I heard the baby, I'm just like, man, this motherfucker rapping. You know, and, and, it, and he came at a perfect time because, you know, I love what rap has been able to do with melody and harmony. To me, when I listen to Lil Baby and Gunna, I'm listening to damn near the blues. Their voices are so so bluesy, they harmonies are so soulful and, 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 and damn near hokey on certain shit. It's just like, man, this shit, I see why my granddaddy like buddy guy. There's some slick ass shit, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? And then the baby pops up out of nowhere, just like lyrical firestorm, but still on some country shit, right. still on some country rap. And I'm just like, like we can do anything, you know what I mean? And I, I, so I get inspired constantly by the youth, you know what I'm saying? I, I constantly am inspired by new artists because they're, bro they're breaking rules like a motherfucker. For I sure. remember Ice-T was one of my favorite rappers. And if you don't know why, you should probably listen to um, Ryan Pays. You know what mm. I mean? Um, but he said... I heard that, that six in the morning shout. I hear you. <sighs> what you I know you know what you're talking about out here. He, um, and Power, too. Oh, my God. Such a great album. But I said back in the days, he had one wish he could sing. And I remember thinking, what? I sing? Nigga, sing? Who the fuck want to sing? Rap, nigga? That was when you know he used to pit rap against R&B. And now I look and rappers have mastered everything. Rappers sing, they do harmony, they do melody, they voice, they, they just, and, 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 it's, and it's dope because that's what we could do doing sampling, using samples, and when they took that from us, we had to learn how to do it ourselves. I remember asking Zero, like, I was like, cause Z, anybody know Zero? Yeah. Like, Legend. All right, so, all right, so Zero like a rap, and then he'll beat you up and shoot you, and then he'll rap some more. And it all be from Cecile Place, because you probably did some fuck shit and deserved it. <laughs> but I remember asking Ro, man, I was like, man, how did you learn how to sing? Like, he's one of the best bluesy, folky, soulful singers I've ever heard. And he say, man, you know, man, I, I wanted this boy to, to sing on my thing, you know, on a song I had. And he tried to charge me like hundreds of dollars. And I said, shit, I could do this shit myself. And I was just like, man, that really is the spirit. Now, I still ain't figured out singing. I done tried, but I'm whack. But, but just that do-it-yourself mentality is such a beautiful thing because that's the same mentality that Cool Herc had in the park. That's the same mentality that the Juice Crews had. That's the same mentality that Large Professor had. Same, prof same mentality that Trey still has, that Roe has, that Slim Thug has. And I think that's a beautiful mentality. You know what I'm saying? That do for self of it all. And I think that these are great do for self times. Like I didn't realize until a homie told me about a month ago. He was like, you know, OT Genesis still ain't even dropped no album. I was like, I was like, man, you, think, you know how perfect that is? Right. Like he literally just got him waiting every quarter for a new right. record. Like right. I'm bang y'all ass out. So by the time he ever feel like really dropping one, you know the world gonna go crazy. Cause I need my OT Genesis right. three, four times a year. Right. Like, man, who don't need some dope boy music in the morning headed to the airport? Oh, you know, you know? know what? You, you don't sleep on OT Genesis. That boy got some slack. Who hate? The motherfucker better not hate. <laughs> <laughs> bitch, I little bae. Bitch, I'm bae. Yeah, I'm I was bae. like, yeah, man, that's this, crazy. this man really don't. But I'm country. So I love his shit. It, mm. it, it, it got that groove. But he, sh he shouldn't have to play by nobody's rules but his own. Right. You know what I'm saying? And, I, and I, that's what I love about right now. You know, right now, you don't have to hand in a demo. Your Instagram is your demo. Right. You can get up and sing on your Instagram every day. And somebody, if something going to go viral, whether it's good or bad, now if you can't jump on your head at the same time, you know, you might go viral for the wrong reasons, but you have such opportunity. And I know it can feel hopeless, and I know it can feel dark at times, especially if you're paying rent in New York. God damn. But, boy, oh boy. But, but, I, but I promise you guys that the effort that you put in, you know, if, if, you, if, you were, if it will reward you if you keep, if you keep putting that axe to the bottom of that tree, eventually it's going to fall. That's real. That's real. Y'all clap it up for that, man. I hope you all are inspired by this legendary gentleman sitting to my right. Mike, before I let you go, um, I know how us in hip-hop in the community look at you. Um, do you see yourself in that legendary light like 
as one of the greats, as, as an icon, as somebody who transcends even music, but just as a bigger figure. You know what I mean? I see myself as Shay's husband. Okay. And a rapper trying to impress a room. Wow. Wow. I'm, I'm constantly trying to impress y'all. So I never want to get comfortable. I accept um, the accolades that are given humbly and appreciatively, but acceptance, um, accept it too often makes you lazy. And it makes you, um, it makes you lean on the glory of past times too much. Mm. And my job is to burn down every single village run of jewels and conquers. Crazy. So. Crazy. Y'all clap it up for Killer Mike, y'all. This is this has been amazing. Um, any anything you want to leave the people with? Any parting words? Not just you. You can. You must. You will. That's the mentality you have to wake up with every day. I can. Yeah. I must. I will. Every single day. Every single day. And it'll work out. Absolutely. That's what's up. And if you ain't got run the jewels one, two, and three, make sure you get that. When can we expect four? Man, soon and very soon. I don't know if we're gonna drop it last of this year, or top of next year, but I can I can tell you. We we beat we beating tracks up and we recording more music than we need. So Crazy. not only are y'all gonna get four, I think y'all gonna hear a lot of dope music for the next couple of years. And y'all know what we do. We put out an album, we hit the road for two years. So nice. let's let's have a hell of a goddamn 2020 to 22. That's what I'm talking about, man. Give it up for Killer Mike, y'all. Love. If you've never been to a Run the Jewels show, make sure you do yourself a favor. That's definitely something that you want to experience. Mike, thank you so much, man, for everything that you bring to the table, everything you've done for the game and for being here today. Thank we you. Appreciate Absolutely, you. man. And I'm glad it wasn't that other guy, Torre. <laughs> Have a good one.